Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. So my name's Greg. Uh, this is Tim. So we both work on GKE security. Uh, Tim's actually a uh, chair of uh, SIGL, uh, Kubernetes, uh, one of the K Kubernetes security SIGs. So when we were thinking about um, the talk we wanted to present here, we wanted to talk about node isolation inside of clusters. And when we were thinking about it, we were kind of thinking about how an attacker moves through clusters, looking for kind of unexpected ways to move through clusters that the people who designed the kind of walls and separation inside of those clusters didn't really expect them to do things in that order. And it sort of felt a little bit like parkour, this, this sport of free running where you know, these athletes are looking at the urban built environment and looking at buildings and HVAC systems and railings and staircases in ways that the architects and builders kind of never intended them to be looked at and used in. So we're gonna kind of keep this theme throughout our talk and we're gonna talk about node isolation and uh, how we can attack it and maybe how we can do better than node isolation. So uh, we're gonna start out by uh, talking about basically two containers. So this, the fundamental problem is you have a trusted thing and an untrusted thing and you wanna separate them somehow. So one way to do that is to use what we're calling node isolation where you put one set of things on one node and then the other set of things on the other node and that seems pretty separate. Except in Kubernetes, it, isn't really that separate, actually. So we're going to kind of demonstrate a, uh, a pretty cool, I think it was a lot of fun to write attack, uh, to kind of like jump through all the hoops um, to break that isolation. And then we're gonna talk about kind of better ways that we can think about isolating things inside the cluster and leave you with some recommendations. So we have two containers. <clears throat> and for the purposes of this talk, we also have a fake company that does like a really specific web hosting thing. So they just host uh, parkour gym websites. So it may not be the best business model ever. Uh, total addressable market, probably fairly small. Uh, but that's what they do. So uh, they have things that are internal to the company and one of those things is a payments pod that does payments things. Um, and then they have the customer workloads which, you know, for the purposes of this talk, we tried to come up with the best possible pun name we could. Uh, with the intersection of parkour and Kubernetes, and I present to you maximum uptime. Uh, I hope you like it. Um, and so the, the red container here, is, or pinkish container here, is a customer website uh, that is basically an untrusted workload that this hosting company is running. So if we don't do anything, they get scheduled right next to each other, or they could be. And the threat model is basically, we expect that thing to get owned, like the these um, kind of people running these websites may not, you know, patch regularly. I don't know, maybe competitors are actually going to try and attack each other. Uh, at one point or another, there's probably going to be malicious code in this uh, untrusted container at some point. And if that happens and it breaks out, uh, and it can access other stuff on the node. So, like, container breakouts, is that a thing that we need to worry about? Um, and, yeah, I think it is. In this, in this scenario where you have a trusted thing and an untrusted thing running together, uh, if you look at kind of just this year, there was a vulnerability in Run C that uh, broke this boundary. And so if you were running in this situation where you had the two things like right beside each other with just a container boundary in between, you would have probably had a bad day in your production system. So we basically think bugs are inevitable here and that uh, we'd like to have more than this uh, container boundary. And we don't think it's really enough just kind of on its own to separate trusted and untrusted. So you can do better, definitely, with, with uh, containers. Uh, so you can use SecComp, AppArmor, SE Linux. Uh, these have a pretty steep learning curve, uh, and they are like reasonably difficult to maintain, this kind of uh, cut tightening of the screws of, of, uh, of kind of constraining an application. And one of the real challenges is that you actually have to really fully exercise it in tests. So like if you want to make sure that that SecComp sandbox really represents all the syscalls that this application is going to make, you'd want to be pretty sure that you got them all in tests so that you don't block it when it's, uh, block a syscall when it's running in production. And, you know, for like this particular company, like lots of different websites, maybe doing different things, maybe need different sandboxes. So that's a lot of work for a kind of small hosting company. And even if you do all that work, then maybe there's just vulnerabilities that blow it away anyway, because uh, effectively you've got a shared kernel here with some extra stuff. Uh, and so if the stuff is whitelisted, that you know the syscall that the website actually needs has the vulnerability, 
and it you know kind of passes through the other uh, whitelisting in the other uh, security mechanisms here, then that's sort of it. Um, so this leads people to, especially security people who are no, used to separating things with VMs, uh, to think, okay, well, let's just stick them on separate nodes then and put VM boundaries in between. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, so payments stuff on payments node, customer stuff on customer node, woo. Um, and there's like non-security benefits here. So you get separate failure domains, uh, you get some resource isolation that you don't get with C groups. Um, so that's not bad from that perspective. But is it actually good enough for security, like if trusted and untrusted like this? And this is where we're gonna focus for the rest of the talk. So um, we're gonna kind of walk through how you set this up and then we're gonna attack it. So um, how do you set it up? There's a few different pieces. Um, labels and taints are key. And then you also kind of need to deprivilege the kubelet quite a bit uh, to make this like any sort of reasonable boundary at all. So um, in terms of labels, you would say, all right, uh, I'm gonna add a label to my nodes so that uh, the payments pods can target, target the payments nodes. That's how the payments pods make sure they end up on the payments nodes. And then I also need to add a taint. And this is kind of like a little counterintuitive that I have to do both of these things, but basically the first one's saying, please land here. And then the second one, which is the taint, is saying anything that isn't a payments node should never be scheduled on this node. So that's what the no schedule says. Like, don't put anything, don't put no, uh, non-payments things on this node. And so once you've done that, then in your pod spec, you can target those things. So you would say in your pod spec, please put me on payments nodes uh, using the label. And then you would also say, I can tolerate the, the, the tainted node that is allowed for payments. And that's basically enough to say, all right, payments things land on a payments node. So then switching into kind of like the API, uh, sort of the protections here and the, and the kubelet deprivileging. So the node authorizer is pretty key. So node authorizer, uh, which you know, is not uh, sort of on by default with Kubernetes, but is on by default in lots of places such as GKE, um, sits between the kubelet and the API server. So uh, there's also an admission controller, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, and so kubelet, requests from the kubelet go like through this, uh, through this re request path. And the idea of the node authorizer is to limit kubelet to least privilege. So it's really saying, hey, kubelet, you're only allowed to do the things that are necessary to do your job. And that's things like write to the... Uh, so the node authorizer is constraining what the, the kubelet is allowed to do, uh, including like, which, which things it can write to, and especially uh, relevant is which secrets it can read. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then uh, admission is, is more fine-grained controls over that. So, it's, uh, okay, the kubelet can modify the node object, but which parts of the node object should the kubelet really be allowed to modify? Uh, and so you need both of those things, and then you like kind of deprivilege the kubelet to a reasonable extent. So this is the full picture, labels and taints to do the things, and remove some kubelet privileges. So that we're kind of now set up for this to work, so let's talk about how we can attack it. So I'll hand it over to Tim. All right, thanks. So uh, yeah, so we've got this set up. Our payments pod, our, our payments pod is on a separate node um, from our maximum uptime node, uh, which is what um, got compromised. So the attacker has access to the node on the right, and the goal of this attack is going to be to get access to the payments secret. Um, the uh, payments pod or the payments node can access that payments secret. It has to be able to uh, because it's referenced by the payments pod. Uh, but the compromised node can't get access to it um, because the node authorizer blocks it. And so the goal of this attack is actually going to be, what if we can get that payments pod to reschedule onto the attacker node? Then the node authorizer would say, okay, you have an access to uh, the payments secret, so I'll let you access the payments secret. Um, so that's going to be the first step of the attack. We have to modify the node uh, so that the payments pod can be scheduled onto that node. Uh, from there, we'll kill off the real payments pod um, and then let it be rescheduled to the node. So let's take a look at that first step. Um, in order for the payments pod to get scheduled onto that uh, customer node, we have to first remove the customer taint, uh, and then we need to add the class equals payments label that we're going to be using. So I'll switch over to the demo now. Um, 
We maximize that? Uh, oh. There you go. All right. That's as big of a go as I think. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are running as root on the node, and that means that we have access to everything that's on that node, including the kubelet's credentials. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is we'll just uh, set up kubectl to use the kubelet config and credentials, and um, then we'll be using that through the rest of the demo. Let's take a look at the current setup. Um, in the payments namespace, we have our payments processor pod running, um, and we can see that that's running on the, uh, the payments node. In the customer namespace, we have our customer uh, pod running on the customer node, uh, which is our compromised node in this case. So what happens if we just try and get that secret using the kubelet's credentials? Um, it's blocked as expected by the node authorizer. So we get a permission denied, forbidden. Um, so now let's try and modify the node. First thing we have to do is grab the current node object. Um, and then I'm gonna do this uh, jQuery command. You could do this in an editor. It was easy to script, easier to script up with jQuery. Uh, we're just adding a class equals payments label. That's the first line. Uh, we are deleting all of the taints on the spec. Um, and then we have this little uh, bookkeeping thing. We have to remove the resource version so the update can actually work. Um, and let's go ahead and apply that. Um, so this replace command on kubectl is doing an update request. Um, and it's rejected. Uh, in this case, by the node restriction plugin, which prevents us from removing taints as of 111. But the restriction plugin and the node authorizer don't prevent us from deleting the node. Uh, so let's just delete the node. <laughs> Uh, that worked, and we can see that our customer node is no longer running, uh, just the payments one. And now we can go and recreate the node using this new modified taintless node. That succeeded. Um, and if we take a closer look at that, we can see we have in fact added the payments label, um, and if you look under the spec, uh, there are no taints there. So let's jump back to slides here. So at this point, uh, we've sort of succeeded. Uh, we have removed the, um, the taint, added the label. At this point, the payments pod could schedule onto this node. And if we wait long enough, it might eventually uh, have a scaling event or do an upgrade or just crash, and maybe it will get rescheduled on our node. Um, but we can do better than that. Um, and I'll hand it off to Greg to tell you how. Okay, so the next steps are we want to actually kill off that real payments pod. And uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to create a fake pod, make it older, put it in a replica set, have a replica set, kill the newest. So let's just step through those. So the first thing we're going to do is create this fake payments pod. So Kubelet's just not allowed to create regular pods, uh, but it can create static pods. So we're gonna create a static pod, which is basically just like Kubelet managing its own pod, running on the node. And then these are mirrored in the, in the API. So you may have heard this like concept of a mirror pod. And basically, Kubelet's creating a, a pod on its own, and then there's a, a mirror object that's being created in the API server. So the API server knows what's going on. So if you kube control get pods, then you can still see, see these uh, static pods. So once we have this kind of like fake payments, we're gonna start abusing replica set to do our bidding. So uh, replica set's job in this, in this kind of scenario is to keep one copy of the payments pod running. And what we're gonna try and do is make a kill the legitimate one and have our one uh, be the only one that's there. Um, so replica set's gonna say, hey, I've got two of these, I need to kill one off. Um, hopefully it kills uh, the other one. Um, but there's a wrinkle here. Uh, so replica set actually kills the newest pod, and the, the logic there is, well, you know, this other pod has been ready for a long time. It's been running. It's fine. I, I, I don't need this new pod that just started. I'll just kill that one off. So we actually need to make our pod older. Uh, so our pod needs to be like the OG payments. Like it, it needs to be like the payments that's been around for the longest time. Uh, and so we definitely don't want that one killed off. And please kill off the the much newer one. So uh, we, we need to actually modify the ready time on our fake payments pod. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, kind of like the final piece of this is like once we've got all that set up, then we're going to delete ours and then have replica set, recreate it, and hopefully it recreates on us. So um, let's step through it and demo. Get my windows right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at the fake payments pod that we're creating. So that's this mirror pod. It's like super boring pod. It doesn't do anything. This just calls pause, which just sleeps. And this is just a shell uh, so that we can uh, use that replica set. So we're just going to try creating that. And as we expect, Kubelet's not allowed to do that. Uh, so we get this uh, very helpful error message that says, hey, you can only create mirror pods. Great, let's create a mirror pod. So uh, the way we create a mirror pod is by copying just that YAML into this special directory. And the Kubelet's going to notice that new file there, create a static pod locally, create the uh, mirror pod representation in, in the API. So if that worked, we should just see it with get pods. And yeah, so we can see we've got the regular payments pod and our new mirror fake payments pod, and they're both in the running state. So uh, next we're going to get set up to mess with a replica set. So a big, giant, long pod name here. And uh, we're going to grab the JSON representation of the, of the mirror pod out of the API server so we can mess with it. And the first thing we're going to do is make our pod the, uh, the OG uh, payments pod. So uh, this one's been running since 2018 API server. Well, please believe us. Um, so uh, we set that up. And here we're actually just going to interact with the API directly. Uh, what we're doing can't actually be easily done with kube control. So we're setting curl up to use the uh, kubelets client cert and just grabbing the API server's IP address. And then we're just going to patch that mirror pod object with that new ready status time. So this tells the API server, I've been ready since 2018. I've been doing this a long time. And uh, we're going in through the status sub-resource of the pod. So the next step, that worked. Uh, the next step is uh, we need to be in the replica set. So the way we tell the replica set to adopt this pod is just add this label. So, hey, replica set payments processor, that's your name. Uh, we'd like this pod to be part of your responsibility. And so as soon as we do that, it's going to be looking at two pods and making a decision about which one to kill. So if that worked, it should just be our mirror pod running, and the um, real payments pod should be gone. So yeah, you can see we've only got one. It's just us. There's a mirror pod. So now we've effectively dosed the, um, uh, the legitimate um, payments pod. Let me just pause this for a sec. Um, and so it's not running anymore. It's, uh, it's down, and uh, the, the mirror pod is the only thing running. So the final step, steps in the attack here are to now that we're the only payments pod, if we delete ourselves, there's going to be zero payments pods left. And so the replica set's going to say, well, I need one. And uh, there's a, you know, a race then about like, which payments node is going to get, get scheduled on. Is it, it could get scheduled on the legitimate payments node, or it could get scheduled on us. Um, so if we delete it, um, and then we check kind of like where it gets scheduled, like as we were kind of running this demo, and getting it ready, I'd say probably like better than half the time it landed on us. Uh, some of other times it landed on the actual payments uh, node. And you can see here that it's actually landed on our, uh, our demo node. Uh, but if that hadn't happened, we could just do it again. And we could just script it until it did. <clears throat> so uh, if everything works, then uh, we should be able to get access to the secret. Hey! <laughs> OK, uh, so a quick recap. We modified the node to make it friendly to uh, payments, the one, the one that we controlled. We messed with replica set to make it kill the real payments, got it scheduled on us, and then we could beat the node authorizer check to get that secret. Um, so 
like sounds scary. <laughs> um, so uh, we've actually been working on uh, in Sigoth kind of protecting against these type of attacks. So um, as in Tim's section of the demo, I mentioned that um, you can't just modify the, the um, uh, he couldn't make a modification directly. He had to delete the node and then recreate it. And that protection was brought in in 111. And this attack that we just demonstrated actually only works on 112 because we fixed the delete the node and recreate thing. So like, if you thought, well, that's dumb. Uh, yeah, we know, we fixed it. Um, <laughs> So uh, the node authorizer doesn't allow you to do that anymore. But the, the point of this talk is not, hey, upgrade to 113, everything's fine. Um, it's actually that uh, this is just one of a, of a number of paths. If you're trying to rely on node isolation uh, to kind of like have this separation, you're kind of gonna have a bad time. And so like, I'm gonna hand it over to Tim to talk more about sort of how we can uh, think about not, uh, pod versus node separation and what the alternatives are. Thanks. Um, yeah, so let's. Uh -oh. I'm gonna move away from you, maybe. Uh, let's uh, let's generalize a bit. Um, so, yeah, we just saw this attack uh, using the Kubelet's credentials to talk to the API server, um, and we saw how the node authorizer uh, can prevent this type of attack. But there's a lot more going on on the node uh, than just running the Kubelet. Uh, you've probably got some other daemon sets running on the node, like the node problem detector. And those daemon sets don't actually go through the node authorizer. Uh, you've got some uh, external networking coming in through the node, um, and we actually had to cut a second demo for time uh, that showed how to uh, man in the middle and intercept some traffic uh, bound for another node. Uh, you've got other nodes in the cluster doing all sorts of things. Um, you can't rely on network policy necessarily to protect those API endpoints because we're outside of a pod, we're outside uh, the limits of network policy. You've got some external services, like a credential provider providing bootstrap credentials to the node. What can an attacker do with that? Uh, you've got some sort of metrics pipeline. What happens if your attacker reports incorrect metrics? What can they do? Logging pipeline, uh, you can no longer trust your audit logs from the node. Um, and finally, there's probably some remote storage. Uh, and what can an attacker do with access to that remote storage? So the point of this big complicated picture isn't to actually understand everything that's going on here. The point is that it's complicated. Um, and also, the attacker on the node now has access to the union of all of these different things going on. So even if we're running our node in a least privileges model, like those are still a lot of privileges. Um, and in uh, if we compare that to a pod, uh, we see this theme kind of again and again, where in authorization, we have all of the permissions on the node on the node side, whereas in the pod case, we can scope that down a lot more to just the containers running in that pod. Uh, similarly with uh, network access. Continue. Just <laughs> Uh, similarly with network access, uh, we have the union of everything on the node. We can make that a lot more specialized on the pod. We didn't touch on this too much, but in the monitoring case, uh, your monitoring is probably running on the node. Uh, your monitoring is probably running on the node. And so if your node is compromised, you can't trust your monitoring. Uh, in the pod case, your monitoring is still running on the node, uh, but now your attacker is contained in the pod and we can rely on those metrics a little more. 1.4 node isolation is uh, that you have stronger resource isolation. Uh, we have some isolation through C groups on the pod, but we don't hit everything, and so you're still gonna be subject to noisy neighbors uh, in the pod case. But we are still left with this problem of uh, a container escape. And uh, as Greg kind of mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of container escapes happen through the fact that there's a shared kernel for every container on the node. Um, and if you have a vulnerability in that kernel, that can lead to container escape. So the idea of sandboxes is let's run a separate kernel in every pod. And then if you have a vulnerability in that separate kernel, uh, the attacker can escape out of that container, but they're still stuck in this pod sandbox, and they need to chain it together with a second vulnerability to actually get out of there. Uh, so in practice, um, the two main implementations used in Kubernetes today are uh, GVisor, which runs a sort of user space emulated kernel, um, and Kata Containers, which is a lightweight po uh, per pod VM. 
Um, and we abstract this away with runtime class that represents the underlying runtime. Um, and then you can just reference the runtime class uh, from your pod to use that. Um, and there's a lot of links in here if you want to learn more about that. Uh, so node isolation seems like kind of scary, but okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, node isolation might seem kind of scary at this point, but remember those like starting assumptions that we sort of glossed over at the very beginning. Uh, before the attacker can get to escaping your node, they first need to compromise your application, uh, get remote code execution, then escape the container, escalate to root, and then they can actually attack the cluster from the node. <laughs> so can we make those first two steps harder for the attacker? On the application side, this is really going to depend on the specific application. Uh, but some general pieces of advice are to stay on top of patches. Uh, if you choose a minimal base image, then staying on top of patches is a little easier. Um, and then apply uh, application-specific hardening, like using a secure web framework. On the container side, uh, running as non-root should really be the first thing that you try and do. Um, in addition to that, uh, resource limits can help prevent some local denial of service attacks. Uh, least privilege authorization is always a good, uh, good choice and restrict the network with something like network policy or Istio. Um, and if you still want more uh, hardening beyond that, we recommend sandboxes, um, especially if you don't trust your application. If you don't have that first uh, boundary of the application, well, this can add a second layer at the pod itself. Uh, so in summary, uh, nodes are really complicated. They do a lot of things, um, and we know about attacks in them. Uh, and so nodes shouldn't be your only uh, line of defense. Uh, we recommend pod isolation before that. Um, that's what we have. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes left for Q&A. So if you have a question. If you have a question, do raise your hand and I will bring you the mic. How about making containers immutable or just read-only file system? Um, that can we alleviate any of these risks by that? Um, yeah, so uh, there's definitely a lot more uh, container hardening that you can do. Um, and there's a lot of guides out there for that. Um, we, uh, we wanted to just keep it simple here, because partly for time, um, and also because we think that uh, running as non-root is kind of the, the strongest recommendation there. And sometimes, if you suggest too many really hard to implement controls, then um, the most important ones can get lost in that. But, uh, but yeah, uh, read only and um, set comp, and there's lots of other things we can advise on, too. Yeah, I think I'd just sort of add that that's going to help you sort of it's going to make the attacker's job a lot harder when they land in the container when they get that execution, but it doesn't really help you when they're sort of looking to propagate from there. So if they have like beaten that in some way, like that's a good thing to do, but it, it's also sort of not enough for the isolation piece of it. Can you talk a little bit about um, when you advise for sandboxes are appropriate for use versus where they're not? Um, you know, uh, ubiquitous deployment of those or for certain use cases or security profiles? Um, yeah, so it's, it's really going to depend on your threat model. Um, it's probably an unsatisfying answer, um, but it, uh, it's kind of a cost trade-off. Um, sandboxes do add a little bit of overhead, um, some memory overhead and a performance penalty. Um, there's some kind of specialized cases uh, where sandboxes will be um, not really viable, like um, uh, if you need specialized direct device access, for instance. Um, but in the other cases, it's sort of weighing uh, the, um, the security benefits versus the cost of that overhead. Um, and one thing I'll add to that is uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't trust the application, if you don't have that 
uh, two boundaries, one at the application, one at the container. If it's just the container, then we really strongly recommend uh, sandboxing. What do you hear about the discussion around uh, namespace remapping? I, I know it's something we can do in containers, but it's not something that's really supported through Kubernetes, uh, at least as far as I've seen. I, I think sandboxing is kind of the way people go, but. Do you mean user namespace remapping? Yeah, user namespace remapping. Um, yeah, so that's a, another great way of hardening um, the container. Uh, in particular, it makes that step of running as non-root a lot easier. If you're already running as non-root, it doesn't help a whole lot. Um, we are, there's a proposal out for uh, remapping um, at the node level. Um, so all containers will be running with the same remapping. Um, and in particular, again, it just like makes you run as non-root. Um, it's hard because Kubernetes has persistent volumes and so now you need to like maintain that remapping across volumes, across nodes. Um, so that's uh, why we haven't done it yet. <laughs> Yeah, how did you get the replica set label? Was that like allowed to get for the payment or did you just guess it? Um, so the kubelet has permission to list all pods in the cluster. Um, so you could list, uh, so you could look at everything that's running and you say, ah, payments, that sounds interesting. Um, what labels does it have on that? Um, and then you could use all of the labels that are there um, and probably so one of those even is. List Set. Pods that are not running on its node. Yes, yeah, so you can list pods that are not running on the same node. We've talked about um, preventing that. Um, if it was prevented, you could also use the read-only port. Um, you could look at uh, metrics. Um, yeah. Any other questions? We have time. Okay. Do you expect pod security policies to ever come out of beta? <laughs> Uh, sorry, I didn't get security policy to come out of beta. <laughs> uh, come to SIGOTH on Thursday. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that in a lot more detail. Uh, there's problems with it that we're trying to figure out how to address. There are some companies that are now offering to run containers in security enclaves that are provided by SGX extensions, obviously very Intel specific. Are you seeing anybody move towards that type of a, uh, of a, a stance where they'll run in protected memory on a trusted platform? Uh, I think the short answer is no. I think we, we've had some discussions about it. I haven't heard of anyone doing that for real, uh, but maybe they exist. Uh, okay. Um, one thing to add is uh, I think that security enclaves kind of solves um, a slightly different, uh, addresses a slightly different threat model than what container isolation does. And that is our time. So if you have any other questions that you didn't get answered, please talk to our lovely speakers out in the hallway. And thank you very much for coming. Make sure to fill out your feedback forms. Thank you.